and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those that are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If you take your Bibles and open up to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would please. And verse 6. The Hebrew writer says, But without faith it is it impossible to please him, speaking of God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There's power in seeking God. You know, most people say, I believe in God. There is a God. There are gods. And to, to, to man, you know, they seem to create their own gods. You know, what's more important to them? And you can look in the life of many people. What's important to them? What do they spend most of their time with or doing? What takes precedent in their life? That becomes their God. You take animals. Animals have their favorite foods too. Uh, animals have their favorite activities, if it's what you want to call it. And that becomes important to them, you see. That becomes their God. People today, they're in other places, they, they make trees their gods, and they worship trees, and they worship plants, they worship the sun, the moon, the stars, and a whole host of other things. People worship these things and make them their God because that's the only thing that they can do. There is only one way that a person can make the true living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, real to them, is by studying God's Word. It doesn't happen any other way. Any other way that a person, a man, or animals, or things takes place in this life, and they try to make God real to them, it's impossible to do. God will only be real to you, my friend, whether you're a Christian or not, is when you seek Him out. And when you seek Him out, it must be in His Word. And then that God will become real to you. You know, money's real to us in this life. Yeah, we like that money every time and chance we get it, don't we? Yeah, that check comes every month or you get your paycheck every week. Yeah, we like that money. Uh, yeah, we like when we get a gift from someone. We like that. We like new cars and new homes and things better. Nothing wrong with those things. We like those things. But we need also to like the Word of God. We need to make God real in our lives. And it cannot happen unless you're studying God's Word. Because in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. What are you hearing, Christian friend, today? What is it you're hearing during the week? You know what it is, and God knows. Well, it's going to show. It's going to show. You see, the goal for the Christian is, is to become more like Jesus Christ every day. The goal of the Christian is, is to get to know God, have knowledge of Him. You get your knowledge greater and greater all the time, you see. We should be climbing that ladder of success, Climbing to God, getting to know Him better, getting closer to Him every day. Well, my friend, that don't happen unless you're studying God's Word. Because that kind of faith does not come by any other way than by hearing God's Word. Without this kind of faith, it's impossible to please God. You know, when a husband and a, a man and woman get married, excuse me, one of their goals in their marriage life is to please one another in however way they may do it. That should be the goal of a 
husband and wife, to please one another. And it should be a two-way street, by the way. We know what, as a Christian, we ought to please God. You see, it ought to be a two-way street. God pleases us whether you recognize it or not, okay? We take things for granted here in this life, even as Christians we do. And God blesses us with so much every day. God provides for us. He gives. He supplies. He gives everything that we need that pertains to life here and godliness, a godly life. He's given us everything we need. He even, before the church began, before people would have their sins washed away, gave His only begotten Son, His precious Son. He gave Him to die on the cross for us. God has given us everything. God had us on His mind. He is thinking of our welfare all the time, you see. But that needs to be a two-way street as Christians. You know, Christians may not like me too well sometimes. But we all always love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. You see, my wife and I, we might argue sometimes. But both of us, we need to love the Lord our God with all of our mind, soul, and strength, you see. And that's what God wants. He has gave us more than we could ever repay. We can't outgive God. You see, we can't outgive Him. There's none of us, by the way. Because we're humans, there's none of us would give our children to die for a sinful world. Okay? We won't even give a sinful world a chance to hear the gospel and become Christians sometimes. Yeah, we see all these bad things taking place. And we immediately put them in the fires of hell. But God didn't do that. He'd give everyone a chance. He has always done that. He's given everyone a chance to turn away from their wickedness and come to Him. Seek Him out. Make God real in their lives. What you've been hearing for the last month was show in that month's time. It was showing your life. If you've been studying God's Word and hearing God's Word and building your hope and your faith upon God's Word, that's what people's going to see in you. But if you've been listening to worldly things all this time, and, and been taking in all the doom and gloom that the world has to offer, that's what people's going to see in you. Now, you may not like that, but it's the truth. It doesn't have to be that way. Hebrews 11 and 6, the Bible says, but without faith it's impossible to please Him. How do you feel? When you make God angry, you see, when you don't please Him, there's no in-betweens there. He's, he's either pleased with you or He's angry. How do you feel when you make the one who laid His life down for you on the cross angry? Well, we ought to love the Lord enough to not make Him angry. Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God, or she, must believe that he is. There's more than just believing that he's God, you see. Your life is going to show it. Your life is going to show that you're dependent upon him. You cast your burdens, your cares upon him because he cares for you. You go to him when you have problems and seek for help. You rejoice and you give Him praise for it because of the good things that happen in your life. You see, this very moment, we all have freedom to worship Him the way He wants us to here in this country. This very moment, Eva to us is breathing in oxygen, which God has provided. We didn't provide it. It didn't come from us. It came from God. 
Each of us uh, have clothes on this morning, cover our bodies. Well, each of us have perfume and, and these other things that we use for the body. And each of us are going to eat dinner today. You see, have water to drink or whatever it is that you're going to drink. Each of us, if we need glasses, guess what? There they are. Mm, I see, can't see now, but I can now. Well, God has provided me with glasses so I can see. He got light. Yeah, well, we got light. Don't, don't, aren't you glad you don't have to have a candle or something? We've got a lot of things. Air conditioning. Heat in the winter time. And I tell you what, it goes on and on and on and on. God provided that for us. And we need to be grateful. We need to be people who want to please Him all the time because of all that He does for us. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, I'm rewarded uh, <clears throat> when I work a couple weeks and then I get a paycheck. I'm rewarded for the work that I give to that company. A paycheck. We're rewarded when we live a faithful life unto the Lord Jesus Christ when we die. You know, when you go to a funeral and you see someone laying there in the casket, and, and, and the audience out there, there are those who are close to this person, and they're crying, shedding tears because they miss them. Well, my friend, we're going to reward in heaven, and you can't receive it until you die. This eternal life, think about it. People are spending billions upon billions of dollars every year to live longer here in this life. And they're not taking care of their eternal life. You see, my worst fear is, yeah, I don't see any of my family get a, a bad disease or a heart attack or get crippled or anything like that. But there's something worse than that. I don't want to, ever, I don't want to see my family have to go to hell and burn in that lake of fire for all eternity. That's the worst fear in my life. And it ought to be the worst fear in every Christian's life. For themselves and for their loved ones, their husbands, their wives, their children, moms and dads, aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas, and loved ones. That'll be a worse fear. I'm telling you, the Bible says that we must believe that He is, and he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. I'm telling you, if you will live a faithful Christian life unto Jesus and His Word and take your, until you take your last breath, you have a reward waiting for you in heaven for all eternity. A reward is waiting for you. Yeah, that reward will be worth anything that you go through here in this life. You know when a mother has a baby, they go through nine months of getting sick and having pains, staying up all night and this and that. But when that baby's born, they hold that baby in their arm, they tend to forget about all that. And their mind's upon that precious baby. Well, you and I, we may go through hard times, whatever, whatever it might be in this life, but you know what? If we're faithful unto Jesus and His Word unto the end, and we stand before Jesus... We'll forget all about those things. The only thing we're going to hear is, Well done, good faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. And every one of us will be smiling with great joy. We'll have forgotten all the pains that we had here in this life. But my friend, it's because you are seeking Him out. Is that going to happen? If you're seeking God out, it's going to show in your life. People are going to see that. There goes a godly man. There goes a godly woman. Not because they told me, but I watch them. I tell you what, they're godly people. They do really believe in what Jesus and the Bible says. That's what God wants from us. 
We have prisons full of people who are lost. They've committed murder, thieves, drunkards, druggies, and a whole host of other sins. We have prisons that are full of them. We have a world full of them. Them are the people that Jesus came to die for, my friend. Before you were washed into the blood of the land, guess what? You were lost in sin. You may not have been a murderer or one of those other sins, but you were lost in sin. And when God looks at sin, that's what he sees, you see. I'm guilty as that murderer. I'm guilty as that thief. I'm as guilty as that drunkard or that druggie. I'm as guilty as that one that uh, molested that child. My sins are just as bad in the eyes of the Lord. And I want to tell you what, he forgave me when I was obedient to the gospel. The apostle Paul, before he came Paul, he was Saul. And guess who he was murdering? No, he wasn't going out murdering the druggies and the drunkards. He was murdering Christians. He was murdering godly people. He was murdering the children of God, the church, the kingdom of God. And God forgave him because he was obedient to the gospel. And guess what also Paul was? He was a man, a Christian that wanted to please God. He was a Christian that believed that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him because Paul diligently sought God out. Paul sought God out. Paul lived for the Lord Jesus Christ until he died. Paul was faithful to Jesus and his word until he died. Some think people think Jesus was a lunatic. Allowing those people do that to him. Some people think Paul was a lunatic. If you read uh, um, <clears throat> oh, I lost where I was talking about. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and chapter 12. All the things that Paul went through to see that the word of God got preached. People said, probably said he was a lunatic for going through that. He's a extremist going through that. He should never allow himself to be put through that. I would never go that far. What did Job do? He's Satan. Satan wanted to get Job away from God. That was his intentions. And so he told God, you let me have him for a little while and he'll curse you to his face. And so God told Satan, he didn't tell Job. He told Satan, you do what you want with him, just don't take his life. Because God knew that Job was an upright man. He was a godly man. He was a man that believed that God is and he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Job sought God out. And so Satan did all that he did, could do to him. And Job was a miserable man when Satan got done with him. You know, his wife didn't even come and help with his bulls and his sores. And his friends didn't come and give him a drink and, and comfort him. They said, sin, curse God and die. I'm telling you this morning, every one of us, Christians, Husbands, wife, don't matter who you are, we're all going to stand before the Lord one day individually. And we're going to be given answer to God according to what we have done with Him here in this life. You see, what we do here with Jesus in this life will make a difference what He does with us in the next. So we need to understand that God is a reward of them that diligently seek Him. Are you seeking God out? Not just seeking Him, diligently. That means every time that you try to seek Him out and all the avenues that is at your possession to seek Him out, do you use it? It must come first. 
Your relationship with God must come first above your husband, your wife, your kids, and everything else. Because without God, this is the best you'll ever have it here in this world. This is the best you'll ever have it. Without God, you're going to die. Your body's going to die, but your spirit will go to hell and burn for eternity. Separated from God for all eternity. Never to ever experience the, even the essence of His love again. This here letter is written to Christians, my friend. It is time for Christians to start making God real in their lives. This world is real. Look at it. Everything that is in our possession is real. Yeah, we can touch it and use it. But it's going to burn one day. And it ain't going to mount to a hill of beans. It will be of no value. When this world burns, the only thing left standing will be the Word of God. All the money will burn and perish. All the gold and silver will perish. All the people will perish. All the great mighty buildings will perish. All the seas and the oceans and rivers will perish. All the great trees will perish. All the countries of seven continents of this world will perish. The moon will perish. The sun will perish. The stars will perish. And even the black outer space will perish. The only thing to be left standing is the Word of God. It will endure forever, for all eternity. And you and I, if we're going to get to heaven, you and I must be built, standing, rooted firmly in the Word of God. And then when this world comes to an end, that's where we need to be found. It's not good enough to come to church on Sunday morning. It's not good enough to come to church on Sunday night. It's not good enough to come to church on Wednesday night or any other time because your relationship with God is 24 sevens. Seven 24s, however you want to say it. Your relationship with God never ends. When you're at home, when you're at the grocery store, when you're at school, when you're at jobs, when you're on a, a family reunion, wherever it might be, your relationship with God should never change. What about you this morning? Are you diligently seeking Him? Why are you here this morning? Are you here this morning because you're looking up and you're giving your best foot forward to make sure that you're singing and you're praying, you're studying God's Word, your thoughts the things you're doing, the things you're hearing, the things you're seeing. Are you looking up? And are you trying your best to make sure that this is what God wants from me? That's what we're talking about this morning. Diligently seeking Him. I seek Him out because it's not that I first loved Him. He first loved me. The Bible says, I seek him out because I don't know if anybody else will go through what Jesus did and still love me. I seek him out because he made a promise that if, I, <clears throat> excuse me, if I'm faithful unto him until I take my last breath, I'll receive that war, reward, that inheritance. I'll spend eternity with Jesus someday. That's why I seek him out. Yeah, it, if there wasn't a New Testament church here and I had to drive two, three hundred miles, I'd go. I'd go there. If I was 20 years old, I would drive that 300 miles and go there. If I was 50 years old, I would drive that 300 miles and go there. If I was 70 years old, I would drive that 300 miles and go there. If that was the only place there was a New Testament church, I would do it. If it was necessary for me to give me the shirt off my back 
to other people, I would do it for the Lord's sake. If I need to share some of my paycheck with other people, I'll do it for the Lord's sake. If I have an extra automobile and someone needed it desperately, guess what? They got an automobile for the Lord's sake. You see, what kind of people are we if we can't look up and love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? We should be people that have great joy. Why? I have seen people die, take their last breath. Not a pretty sight sometimes. And then I, I stop and look. That's going to be me one of these days. It's going to be me one of these days. And what am I going to be thinking when I'm fighting for my last breath? <laughs> i tell you what, I'm not going to be thinking about my home, my job, or anything else. I'm going to be thinking, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Well, when I shut my eyes in death, guess what? The Bible says my spirit's going to go be with the Lord. Whatever takes place then, my spirit's going to go be with the Lord. And that's, when we study God's Word, we're able to say that. We have the ability to say it. It's real. And it doesn't bother us, you see. We don't worry about it. Because I'm not going to die. This body is. I'm going to spend eternity in a place where there's going to be no more tears, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. You see? Now, I, I, that's something for me to rejoice about, isn't it? And it is for you too. We need to be rejoicing that. We have such a great place that we're going to go to. We need to rejoice enough that it causes you and me to study God's Word. The more you put God's Word in, now listen. <clears throat> These are important words. And we need to listen to this and get this in our minds. The more of God's Word that you and I put in us, the more happier we're going to be. The more joy we're going to have. The more we'll be able to hang on we're going to be able to do. You see, the more of the Word of God you and I have in us, we have the same mind as Christ. The same mind as the apostles. Same mind as the early church. You see, we're all going to go to the same place if we're faithful unto the end. It's a promise by God. You believe God created the heavens and the earth and everything that's in it? Well, He made another promise that we'll spend eternity with Him someday. What are you doing this morning for the Lord? In Matthew chapter 6, if you'll turn over there with me, please. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes it's eating time I forget to pray. And someone reminds me. I know there's been times when I stand up here in the pulpit before we began to have our worship service that I tend to forget to pray and someone reminds me. But God's people needs to pray, not only at mealtime. God's people need to discipline themselves and make it urgent in their lives that they get away from the things of this world and spend some time with God in prayer. Now, I know we know this, but God, I speak to God in prayer. He give that to me and to you too. He speaks to me through His Word. God doesn't talk to people any other way these days. Since Jesus arose from the dead, since the New Testament began, God doesn't speak to people anymore. 
verbally. He speaks to us through the Word. Now, if we're Christians, we're children of God, and our efforts are to attain eternal life with Him someday and help others get there, well, we're going to have to use the plan that He set forth in this book and not our own plan. The church needs to have love one for another. Such love that we bond as a family. We bond as a family. Isn't that what God wants? Read through the New Testament and see how the Christians were back in those days. They were bond to one another. When one person had a problem, every person prayed about it and helped them through it. When person, one person rejoiced, all the Christians rejoiced with that Christian. When they had need, every person made sure that that Christian was taken care of or how many Christians were in need. They were taken care of, my friend. And they did it because they loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They did it because they were godly people. They did it because they were full of God and His Word. And I'm telling you this morning, if you're a Christian and you're not full of God's Word, you'll do none of those things. Because God is not real to you, and everything else is. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Very I say unto you, they have their reward. You know, it's easier for me to say somebody else is a hypocrite. And guess what? It's easier for them to say that I'm a hypocrite. And guess what? We go to work with hypocrites. We go to the grocery store for hypocrites. We watch uh, hypocrites on TV. We go to bed with hypocrites. This preacher's a hypocrite sometimes. And so are you. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Though I say unto you, they have their reward. You see, when they, they pray that they can be seen of men, is they don't want to be blamed for nothing. They want the glory. They want people to show respect unto them and them not return it. Not two way street. They don't want to grow out of that. They want to stay right right there where they're at. But Jesus says here that they have their reward already. Whatever they receive from uh, praying as hypocrites, whatever they get, that's their reward. Now, Christian friend, our reward is in heaven with Jesus. It's different from that. It's more glorious than that. That don't even compare. But he says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which seeth in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. How much do you pray, Christian friend? It don't matter who you are. How much do you pray? God's Word is full of teaching His people not only do they need to pray, but how to pray. And how often to pray. What to pray for and not to stop. Okay, is that too big of a job for you? Spend eternity in hell and see how big of a job that is. Die on the cross like Jesus did. See how big of a job that is. Go live in Haiti or a country like that and see how big of a job it is. My friends, we've got it easy in this country. And we have a God who cares about us. And we have a God who's given everything that we need. And the only thing that needs to happen next is that we use it. We put it to work in our lives. Doing what God says. That's what needs to happen. We need to be able to go to God in prayer in a secret place. Every Christian needs to do it. 
Every Christian needs to do it. I'm telling you, you're no better than anybody else. You're nothing special. In, in God's eyes, the faithful are all special to him, you see. Yeah, it don't matter who you are. You need to learn to go to God in prayer, in a secret place, and spend your time casting your burdens of care upon him, and watch, experience the blessings from him hearing your prayers. One of the reasons out of many that I pray to God today is because I prayed to him years, years ago. Times passed. And guess what? He answered the prayers that I made to him. I am growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. My relationship with God is getting better every day, greater every day. And I fight for that. Okay? I fight for it. I'm not going to let anybody stand in my way. Neither should you. If I stand in your way, you shouldn't let me. You should get me out of your way. That's what God has to offer. When he says in secret, he shall reward. When he says in secret, he shall reward us openly. That's talking about not only heaven, but in this life. Can you truly say, I do. I hear other Christians saying it. Can you truly say, wow. The Lord answered my prayer. The Lord blessed me. Did you ever go to God and, and sing a song just in praise to Him because of that? God supplied me. I'm telling you what, He's brought me this far, hasn't He? You? Yeah. He's still protecting us, watching over us, loving us, and giving us the things that we need. He is still doing it. Let me ask one question before I close. After God making all that possible, doesn't He deserve your best and my best? When He sent His Son Jesus on the cross, He gave His very best. Does He deserve that back? Can you answer in your own mind? Can he deserve that? Does he deserve that back? Or does he deserve us to withhold that from him? Think about that, Christian. The Bible says in Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please him. The last person we want to hurt. Okay, don't worry about hurting me. The last person we want to hurt is the Father in heaven. He's the last person we want to hurt. And I'm telling you, the Bible says that in Ephesians that we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do not put in practice in our life what the Bible says. We grieve the Holy Spirit. You ever been grieved? Did you ever grieve over something? Yes. Well, that's what we do to part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. We grieve Him when we don't return our love back to the one who first loved us. I hope this message has sunk in because the church desperately today needs to do that. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living and turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning, God and His Word through His Holy Spirit is nudging at your heart about something has been said from His Word. You need to make a decision. That's because of sin. Sin will separate us from God for all eternity, and God doesn't want that. He has provided a way for the Christian. When we fall short of His glory, He's provided a way we can come back to Him.
The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we'll confess our sins to Him, speaking of Jesus, that He is just and He's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God is still working. He's still giving, still making a way.